Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to open Hot Topic Symposium session focused on insect fat. Insect production for food and feed is gaining a lot of attention. Edible insects are fast growing market with predicted, predicted annual growth of over 26% to reach $4.6 billion market by 2027, according to research and market. We have uh, we have several experts with us today who are passionate about insect fat. We will share our opinion and perspective of this to on this topic. So Dr. Uh, Xalan Lu from Cargill, she will give us an overview of insect industry uh, and discuss an opportunity and challenges of using insect oils. Then Dr. Timber, uh, Timberlin from Texas A&M University will talk about uh, black soldier fly and all the opportunities that this, um, this insect is bringing with focus on fat. After that, Dr. Dalan Tsongpa from Ghent University will share details of her research focused on using insect fat as a substitute for structured fat in bakery and other application, and uh, answer the question if consumers are ready for insect fat. Then we will have a 20 minute panel discussion so please submit your, uh, submit your questions uh, in the chat option. So with that, I will move to, uh, I, with my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Xalan Lu. She's a senior development scientist in Cargill, where her work is focused on cutting edge innovations in edible oils area. Dr. Lu, she received her PhD for, in polymer science at Fudan University in China in China and completed postdoctoral training focused on development of vegetable oil-based products at the Ohio State University in USA. She has published over 26, uh, 26 uh, articles in scientific journals and seven book chapters, and she has been served as an editor board member in Halion for four years. It's a pleasure, Dr. Lu. Uh, we are ready for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this uh, AOCS Hot Topics Symposium, focus on the insect fat. So today I will be talking about insect fat as an alternative source for feed, food, and the industrial applications. Uh, the topic will be focused on background of insect fat and the benefit of insect production and the insect composition also uh, free, fatty acid, free fatty acid profile of typical insect and its application uh, in feed, food, and industrial areas, and also challenges of insect fat uh, in application, etc. So eating insect fat has a very long history before human acquired tools for food hunting and food collection insects played a substantial part of their diet. There are numerous uh, historical references uh, to the use of insect for food. Currently, uh, 2 billion people in 113 countries consume uh, in insect. Edible insects are a potential solution to increase the environmental and the health uh, issue including climate change, uh, male nutrition, food, food insecurity, and the environment degradation resulting from agro-industry uh, production. In 2013, uh, FAO of the United Nations published uh, Edible Insects Future Prospect for the Food and Feed Security, which presented a comprehensive analysis uh, of human composition insects globally and an advocate 
for edible insect as a viable future food source. So since this landmark report, an interest in edible insect, insect has in, increased. In 2019, the global uh, insect market value exceed 112 uh, million dollars. Uh, it is predicted to uh, increase uh, to over 1.5 billion by 2026. So this increasing demand for alternative protein, fat, and the economical food source, uh, along with shifting trend in dietary needs, is likely to stimulate uh, the market value. Insect production has three major uh, advantages. Uh, health benefit. Insects provide a good alternative uh, animal uh, protein. Many species of insect has a high content of protein, limb fat, and a sufficient calcium, iron, and zinc. Insects are already part of the diet for many countries. The environmental uh, benefits include emission of greenhouse gases by insects are far less than those for most other livestock. Uh, insect rearing requires far less land and water than uh, livestock. Uh, ammonia, ammonia emission associated with insect rearing are also lower than livestock rearing. Because uh, insects are cold blood animals, their efficiency in converting food uh, into protein is very high. Uh, for the economic and social factors, uh, Raising and har harvesting and raising insects also provide job opportunities for the communities. Here is an example of overall environmental uh, impact of insect rearing compared with traditional livestock raising. Uh, mealworm production showing the least environmental impact in terms of uh, carbon dioxide emission are uh, energy use and the land usage. Insect is composed of protein, fats, uh, carbohydrates, and minerals, vitamins, in which protein is a major uh, component. And for this book, my son helped me uh, draw this. Uh, the protein content in insect varies from uh, 20 to 60. 76% of dry matter, depending on the type and the development stage of the insect. And the fat is the second largest component of insect. Its content can vary between 7.4% and 47% on dry matter basis, depending on the several factors such as species, uh, life stage, and environmental uh, conditions. So here is a, a major uh, fatty acid profile of six typical insect fat. The lauric acid, which is C20 content in fat from the black soldier fly larvae, is very close to the content uh, in palm uh, kernel oil. Black soldier uh, fly larvae fat could have great potential as an alternative fat to replace palm kernel oil. Uh, field cricket fat has very similar fatty acid content as palm oil. It also could, uh, has potential uh, as palm oil alternative. Mere warm lovey fat contains high content of unsaturated fatty acid compared to other five uh, insect fat. Here are the reference for the data shown in the last slides. The fat content of insect, depending on uh, several factors such as species, uh, life stage, diet, and environmental conditions. The figure shows that uh, there is significant in difference in fatty acid content of uh, black soldier fly, larvae, and the pupae. So the, the larvae fat has higher content of uh, lauric acid, while the pubic 
fat has high content of stearic acid and it generally uh, changes in fatty acid, <clears throat> excuse me, generally changes in fatty acid are extremely rapid in insects and occur sometimes only a few hours after exposure to a new diet, for example. And why in mammals, uh, such changes can take uh, weeks. Insect fat have been successfully introduced as an alternative fat source in animal nutrition for feed applications. Uh, studies have been conducted for total or partially replacement of commonly used fat or vegetable oils with insect fat in broiler chicken, turkey, and Japanese quail diet, as well as fish and the nursery pig diets. According to uh, literature, for poultry feed application, study did not show a negative impact on growth performance with a replacement of conventional fat source uh, with insect fat and no any uh, effect on coefficiency of the apparent nutrition digestibility of crude protein and the crude fat was reported uh, with replacement of conventional fat source with uh, insect fat. And the studies shows total replacement soybean oil by black soldier fat, fly fat, significantly reduce the potential pathogenic bacteria in jejune. Using insect fat as a alternative fat source has potential of improving uh, immune response and guard microbial biota. In terms of fatty acid profile, mealworm fat supplemented in the diet of broiler chicken could improve the meat uh, quality. And in agricultural nutrition, scientists mainly focus on the replacement of the current protein resource. While there are studies of using uh, black soldier fly fat as a replacement for ribseed fish and soybean oils performed in, on salmon, uh, rainbow trout, and the carp respectively, and no negative uh, impact on growth performance and no uh, effect on flake composition were observed. Insect fat have high potential in uh, sustainable fish nutrition. Insect fat have been also used as a fat resource in other livestock, uh, such as nursery pig. Uh, similar benefits, uh, such as no negative impact on growth performance and the potential uh, improving product quality were also observed. And using insect oil to replace vegetable oil without any negative effect on performance was also confirmed by trials performed in swine within a uh, cargo animal nutrition business. Uh, recently, studies on insect fat as food ingredient have been reported. And Dr. Dr. Uh, Don Pastaza, our next speaker, and her team have great contribution on this topic. For insect fat in food application, I will briefly introduce the work uh, reported in this area. So Dr. Don Pastaza and her team uh, characterized the physical and chemical properties of for uh, insect fat obtained by an uh, aqueous uh, oil, uh, Extraction. The, the, re, the result indicated that uh, yellow meal warm oil and the lesio meal warm oil and the house cricket shows desirable aroma except dubia uh, cockroach. And the oil fraction of uh, yellow meal warm house uh, cricket and the dubia cockroach has the possibility for expanded. Uh, applications. Bakery products such as uh, cakes, waffles, and uh, cookies have also been produced using black soldier fly larvae fat to partially replace butters. 
The result is promising, showing that insect fat provide a similar structure and functionalities to bakery products as compared with butter in terms of uh, texture and the color. Uh, another study demonstrate that insect fat such as refined yellow mealworm oil has great potential to replace uh, vegetable oil in slacking uh, application without significant uh, impact on consumer sensory. Insect fat based uh, margarine has also been produced uh, and investigated. The results showed that it is possible to use uh, a mixture of black soldier fly larvae fat and the mealworm fat to substitute 75 of lipid and create a margarine with good spreading ability. Insect fat is triglyceride with different uh, fatty acid chains. So similar to vegetable oil, it has great potential for industry applications, such as biofuels, surfactants, cosmetics, and polymeric materials due to the functional groups. So for example, uh, the double bond in fatty acid chain of insect fat can be modified into uh, to introduce new functional groups such as hydroxy groups and uh, epoxy groups for the production of polyurethanes, the polycarbonates, et cetera. And all these uh, materials has a wide applications in coating adhesive and the plastics. This slide showed an example of using insect fat to make biofuels. Uh, compared to plants, uh, insect source is much less time consuming compared to algae is much less basing consuming. And insect also provide a benefit to recycle organic waste into uh, clean energy. Uh, Insect fat are alternative source for feed, food, and the industry application is very uh, promising, but uh, there are challenges to be overcome. Regulation on food, feed use of insects are missing to some extent and vary greatly across the world. So which could hinder innovation and the trade. Another challenge is consumer acceptance. Although edible insect has been part of the human diet in various regions uh, around the globe since the ancient times, people living in modern society and particularly in uh, Western countries feel uncomfortable with the idea of consuming food with ingredients uh, deriving from uh, insects. So raising a uh, value of the opportunity offered by insects for food, feed, production, uh, could help with the uh, uh, societal challenge. Uh, related to regulation, labeling would be another challenge. Now, the production costs for insect protein and fats are still high uh, as ingredient for feed, food, and other applications. Uh, with more focus on insect industry to commercial scale and the development of uh, innovation technologies, the cost could fall in the future. So here, a uh, list of some uh, research institute where uh, research work has been focused on insect fat and their applications. I believe there are more uh, institute working in uh, insect research. So uh, lastly, the takeaway uh, is that uh, insect fat in food is a reality. And insect food, such as insect-based uh, burgers, uh, snack bar, uh, insect fat, fat uh, chickens can be found in current market. And the black soldier fly and the yellow mealworm are the two uh, major uh, insects that are already processed at an industrial uh, scales and insect fat provide uh, many functionalities in food and contributes to a, a sustainable system. Consumer uh, availability of insect fat as an uh, ingredient in food application is also uh, growing. Uh, 
yeah, that's all uh, about this presentation. Thanks so much uh, for attending. Uh, I'm happy to take uh, any question. Okay, so we are. Uh, this is. Uh, we have uh, a few minutes for uh, for the questions. Uh, doesn't look like we have a question in yet in the chat. In the chat. Uh, I have a question, uh, Doctor Lu. Uh, what do you think? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Just a minute, I, there, is, there is a question. Uh, are you saying that IKEA is using insect fat now? Uh, this, the, the picture showing the slides about the insect-based burger is, uh, is a product they uh, sh uh, shown a few years ago in the uh, website. Is it, Wonderful. Yeah. With, uh, thank you. Uh, what what are types of feed used? Uh, in what type of feed probably uh, insect fat is used? So insect fat used in the for the feed applications right now is uh, is 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 for the many folks on the uh, black soldier uh, fly larvae fat and also the mealworm uh, fat. They can be used for. Uh, broiler chicken and fish, and also nursery pig. Thank you. Uh, can you give some examples of black, so black soldier fly larva application in food? Uh, so far there are uh, research work focused on the black soldier uh, fly larvae fat in food applications, so you can Based on the research, you can see uh, the bakery products such as crackers, waffles, snack, and uh, also uh, uh, insect-based based margarine has been produced and uh, consumer sensory also have been evaluated uh, in those uh, literature. Uh, and the last one is, uh, what what main retailers are actively selling insect fat in human food products? So for the for the insect fat for as a food ingredient, and this because when you look at the fatty acid profile of the insect fat, some share similar fatty acid profile uh, as uh, palm kernel oil and the palm oil, so it has potential to uh, replace uh, palm oil. So for the application in in the palm use of using palm oil area, so uh, insect fat has the potential to replace the palm oil in the specific application. And the last question I think you have is, uh, where are the industrial pr uh, production of these fats located? So there are uh, many uh, industry are working on the uh, producing uh, insect-based protein and uh, uh, fat. Uh, when you uh, raise and harvest insect and you, you process to get protein, the meanwhile, you can also get the fat. And when you uh, do the further refining work, you can get refined insect fat. So currently there's uh, um, many regions have the capability to for this uh, processing. So you can see there are companies in France uh, have the capability for the uh, commercial production. Also in US, uh, we will have a facility produce the uh, insect protein and fat. And also some, 
some company located in South Africa and China and uh, Malaysia also have the capability to produce uh, insect-based protein and fat. Thank you. So we have uh, we we still have a few uh, a few questions in the pool, but we can uh, we can hold them for the for the panel, and we will move to the next uh, 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 next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Lu. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jeff Tamberlin. Uh, he's a professor, Agri-Life Agri Research Fellow and Presidential Impact Fellow in the Department of Entomology at Texas A&M University. He is also the Director of the Forensic Investigative Science Program at Texas A&M University and Principal Investigator of the Forensic Laboratory for in Investigative Entomological Sciences Facility at Texas A&M. His research efforts for the past 20 years have been developing methods for production of alternative protein sources for use as livestock, poultry, and aquaculture, aquaculture feed from, from those resources. Predominantly, predominantly he worked uh, on black soldier fly. Since arriving at Texas A&M University in 2002, he had 15 PhD and 20 uh, master's students. Uh, to date, he published eight books, 20, uh, 28 book chapters and over 180 articles and, and have been cited over 10,000 times. It's a great pleasure. Uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Jeff Tamberlin, please uh, please uh, share with us uh, your presentation. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, Delaria, I just want to say thank you. Uh, I, I really appreciate the invitation to be here today, especially with such great speakers. Uh, Dr. Lou, you did a great job, and I'm going to probably reiterate some things that you said and maybe um, expand a little bit in some different directions. Um, what a great time to be speaking about insects as food and feed, especially considering that right now in the United States, the 17-year year cicada emergence is taking place, and there's lots of uh, articles being published on that. Trillions of cicadas are expected to emerge. In fact, there was an article just published in the Washington Post that said that you could eat cicadas and they gave recipes on how to do so. Um, the title of my presentation, Fat Boys Are Back, gives me a chance to talk about insect fat, but specifically about black soldier flies, while also paying homage to my youth and the um, great rap group that uh, was real popular in the 80s, the Fat Boys, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, secondly, the third thing I want to point out is that I am not an expert on fats. I'm going to talk some about it. Uh, our other speakers are much more, uh, have more expertise in those areas. But in, ter <clears throat> in terms of the work I'm doing, James Wallen and Mark Richards at the University of Wisconsin are doing work on fats. And this is two individuals that I collaborate with, and they're co-authoring this paper with me. They provided some information for me to present today. So like I said, the Fat Boys, that's a famous band from the 80s, and uh, what a great time to talk about that in terms of their reference of who they are, but from regards of the black soldier fly, because when we talk about black soldier flies, we mostly focus on protein production. Uh, you don't hear a lot of discussion about the fat associated, about the, associated with them, but they're in a, a massive amount of resource that's available that could be used in a lot of different ways, and I'm going to talk about some of those ways in a minute. So this is the adult black soldier fly, Hermesia lucens. Um, this fly originated from the uh, South America area and it's expanded throughout North America and through globalization it's now um, throughout the world. So wherever people are, basically this fly is present. Uh, the larvae are really where we wanna focus our effort because uh, these larvae can be quite high in protein and fat and you can produce a lot of them very fast. And you know, when we talk about insects as food and feed, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, but can you really produce it at a level 
that can really be engaging as a commodity around the world. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of data about that as well. And I think I can uh, demonstrate that this insect is in fact industrialized. So why are we doing it? So this was brought up in the presenta previous presentation. I'm gonna emphasize it a little more. The main point that we're focused on is we got one world in which we live, we have limited resources, but we're, our human population is growing exceptionally fast, but it's not just people. It's also the livestock that we produce and our pets that are all competing for resources that people need. So how do we adjust our production and agriculture to meet those demands? Well, one idea is that we can free up resources that we would typically give to livestock or to our pets that can then be used by humans. And the reason that's important is because we have extremely limited resources. Uh, one, agriculture is already responsible for, the quarter, for a quarter of the greenhouse gases produced in the world. Uh, secondly, a third of the land that's available for agriculture is already being used uh, for livestock production. And also when we think about um, water use, a tremendous amount of the water that we have available to us is being used for livestock production or agricultural production. At the same time, when we think about just one industry, aquaculture and the production of uh, fish or farm fish, uh, it's having a big impact on our international fisheries. Uh, they're being depleted. There's no other way to say it. It's not sustainable. And we have to find alternate ways of feeding these animals in captivity so that we can produce the, the uh, fish and other seafood products that we want at a level that is sustainable. Compounded by that is we waste a lot of food. So 30 to 40% of the food that we produce in the world isn't used. It either remains in a field or it's not consumed and thrown away. And that's not good either because that's going to produce greenhouse gas, potentially pollute the environment, and it's just not efficient. So there's a lot of work being done on how to use insects as part of a circular economy to make us more efficient uh, in terms of the resources we have available, but also protected the resources we have uh, at our fingertips, i.e. land, air, and water. The black soldier fly answers a lot of these questions. This is the adult Hermesia lucens. Uh, the family uh, black soldier fly, Stratiomyde, is a quite, quite a large family, uh, over 2,000 species. Uh, it's a big family, but there's only one species that we want to focus on, that's Hermesia lucens. So when people talk about soldier flies, they should be talking about this species, but it's more complex than that. We won't get into the complexities of it. But what some people think they're producing is Hermesia lucens. It probably is not Hermesia lucens. But because of the ability of this insect to consume just about anything organic, the larvae consume just about anything organic and keep it out of the landfill, companies are popping up all over the world. Evo conversion systems in the US, AgriProtein in South Africa, Intopro, Terra, Prodix, Enviroflight. The list goes on and on. And what we're seeing now is that other companies are starting to engage this industry. Groups like uh, Filio out of France is focused on the um, nutrition aspects of livestock produce, production. Can these insects be produced to harvest unique minerals or vitamins or proteins or even fats that can then be used as ingredients for other livestock? And then we also have groups that are like Tyson, uh, Cargill, some of these larger companies that are interested in, in the feed side of things, uh, but also the livestock production. But globally, uh, there are a number of companies that mass produce this insect. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the mass production in a second. So one thing to recognize is that the life cycle of this insect is fairly fast. Um, if you were to look at its development, it's 14 days. Uh, but some companies like Evo Conversion Systems has it down to seven days. So they're able to do it twice as fast as anybody in the world. Um, but that's a fast life cycle. So if you think about land use and crop production, uh, you get one cycle a year with this insect at two week intervals, you get 26 crops per year. So you can go vertical with the system too. So you can um, massively overproduce uh, insect-based protein or insect biomass uh, on a single hectare of land that would just dwarf uh, what can be done with tradi traditional life, um, row crops. So can this be maximized and produced at a level that's actually relevant to the livestock uh, industry? Yes, it can. Uh, some of the companies that are out there uh, can do this. I've been to facilities 
that can do this in China. They can digest 100 tons of waste a day with this insect, 100 tons of waste. That'll yield 20 to 30 tons of larvae, which will yield seven to 10 tons of dry product. If we assume that 50% of that is protein, then obviously you can do the math, three and a half to five tons of insect protein per day. And the same could be see, said for the fat as well. But something that's really important about this insect is it's extremely sustainable. Um, because of the sustainability, the fact that it can eat just about anything that's considered quote unquote waste, uh, is a huge boon for the use of this insect. Secondly, it's not known to be a pest species. This fly is very short lived. It lives to mate and lay eggs and then it dies. It's actually quite beneficial. It digests waste and it kills pathogens such as E. coli and salmonella. It can break down uh, toxins like mycotoxins. Uh, so if we think about uh, aflatoxin and maize or groundnut or soy, um, Think about how the black soldier fly industry could partner with traditional commodity groups. Uh, they can take, the black soldier fly can be used to digest and remediate and recycle contaminated products to produce products of value. Because of its benefits and its use and the fact that it is not a pest, it is uh, actually approved for use as a feed ingredient in the United States. So AFCO, the regulatory body in the US has approved it uh, for use in poultry, swine, recently with pet food, and of course with aquaculture select species. So in the United States, this insect is the only insect that's approved across the board for use across these categories. So you can mass produce it as long as you follow the guidelines of AFCO and you can use it as a feed ingredient. Uh, this can be used at, to a certain level. It's been approved in the EU. It's also been approved in Canada, Australia, and pretty much the rest of the world for these uses. So it is definitely globalized. But as I mentioned, most of the work is really focused on the protein side of things. So this insect, depending on what you feed them, and we'll talk about tailoring the insect and producing it, um, is mostly focused on the protein side. But again, it, a large part of it is fat. And the reason being is that the adult doesn't need to feed. So it really relies on the fat it accrues during the larval stage. So when it emerges, that's, that's the energy in its tank. So it has a large amount of fat in its body and it can vary depending on what you feed it as Dr. Lou pointed out previously. The amino acid makeup of the insect is a uh, pretty unique. Uh, the main two main uh, amino acids I wanted to focus on were lysine and methionine. It's exceptionally high in methionine, uh, which is great considering that methionine is synthetically produced. So for poultry, that's a huge boon. Um, it's, it is lower compared to housefly, but housefly is a pest species. It is a recognized pest species. It's a vector for a number of pathogens. It likes to go in people's homes. So there's just not as much interest in mass producing it. But uh, it can be done, but the black soldier fly is high in these amino acids. As far as um, the uh, fat content, uh, let me change this real quick. Okay, I was trying to move my screen a little bit. Yeah, so as far as the, the fat content, uh, they rely on the, the larvae rely on these reserves so that the adult can survive and reproduce. But overall, the body fat of the, the black soldier fly larva is 10 to 33% fat on a dry matter basis, depending on how they're raised. And that's critical because if you're feeding them waste, what you feed them will impact what they are. So you wanna tailor the diet so that you can maximize the production of whatever fat content you're looking for, whatever type of fat you want. Uh, as a feed ingredient, uh, black soldier flies are often evaluated on that protein and rather than fat. So a lot of these companies, they'll produce black soldier flies and they'll harvest the protein and then they're left with the fat. And you don't hear a lot of discussion about how they're using it. There is an interest in it um, as previously outlined, and you're going to learn more about that. But how we use it is still remains to be defined. Uh, previously discussed, if you look at the uh, fatty acid profiles, uh, there's a number of studies that demonstrate that what they're comprised of can vary. Now, this isn't necessarily based on the genetics of the fly or the population specifically being tested. It is important. It really does come down to what you're feeding them. 
So when we look at the black soldier fly as a whole, the saturated fats form about 50% or more of the fat composition of the black soldier fly. So this is an angle that you're looking at, this is what you're interested in. That's what a benefit of the black soldier fly would be. Uh, the unsaturated fatty acids is dominated by two particular ones that were previously discussed. So again, these two fatty acids make up a large portion of what's in the black soldier fly. And again, as I've mentioned before, and just to reiterate the point is that the fat is heavily dependent on the dietary fat. So what is it fed? And we did some work back in the early 2000s where we um, fed black soldier flies fish offal. So we mixed it with actual dairy manure. And we showed that we could manipulate the fat content of the black soldier fly. And I'm gonna show that in a minute. But what we do know is that the black soldier fly can be used as a feed ingredient. So this is just an example, um, a few examples of where black soldier flies were integrated into the diet of uh, different animals. And what we see is that in most cases, like in this case uh, with the Xi'an carp, where they use black soldier fly oil as 100% replacement, we got, they got similar growth patterns as you would see if you were using more traditional fat resources. So it could be served as a replacement to like soybean oil in that case. Uh, with broiler chickens, uh, using the fats, which we see is there's no dietary impact on final weight or daily weight gain. And we see that saturated fatty acids content increase in the chicken by 11%. So it does change the, the composition of the animal that's produced a certain level. So feed formulations still need some work to maximize production so the chickens or other livestock being produced meet the requirements of the company. And uh, as mentioned, rainbow trout is another area. And this was another study, not from us, a decade after our work, but uh, they found that there was no dietary effect when using the fats for raising rainbow trout. In terms of the quality of the meat, this is with chicken breast muscle. Um, they were using it as a replacement or a comparison to soybean meal. And you can see that they did different levels of introduction and there was no effect on the uh, color. Uh, and drip loss and pH were unaffected. So it did not affect the chicken uh, muscle in that regard. When looking at rabbits and two particular muscles in the rabbit, uh, what they found is that lipid oxidation was less in the rabbit muscle when they were fed black soldier fly. And then back with chicken muscle, um, this is just another study showing that there was no dietary effect when using black soldier flies as a feed ingredient. And just to elaborate, elaborate a little more, um, there have been some benefits associated with the health of the animals when fed black soldier flies. So it's increased their immunity uh, and it's in increased feed conversion rates. So there are many benefits to using black soldier flies as a, a feed ingredient. Uh, this is part of the work that we did back in the early uh, the 2000s, where we looked at how to integrate black soldier flies into the diet. Um, of Rainbow trout and what we wanted to see is if we could tailor the insect to be a certain uh, nutritional quality. And what we found is that when we did include fish offal in the diet of the black soldier flies, we could enhance their fatty acid composition. And that's really fascinating because that, what that means is we can really tailor a diet to produce an insect that we want. Uh, some more recent work that we did, and we're working on this paper right now, is we showed that we can use different fatty acids to manipulate not just their nutritional content, but their development time. So we can really tailor the diet, not just for tailoring the insect and what its quality is, but how it's produced. And in this case, we use different fatty acids. And what we showed is that we can change the duration of larval development. And that really affected the pupil outcome. So size is not everything. Um, in this case, we could change the size. This graph on the right is just showing mean pupil weight over time and age of the larvae. And that, depending on the fatty acids used, you could produce a bigger larva or a smaller larva, larva. But sometimes what that would result in is greater concentrations of select fatty acids. So in summary, um, the black soldier fly is approved for use as a feed ingredient. Uh, it's a growing industry globally and it can be mass produced. Hundreds of ton, a hundred ton of waste today digestion is not unreal. Um, it's most work on black soldier fly is focused on protein production and little is known about the fat. So this is what's great about this uh, opportunity today to talk about it is that there's just not as much known about it. 
Now I want to shift gears real quick because if you're interested in the black soldier fly, if you're interested in insects of mass production, I just want to uh, mention a little bit of work that we're doing. Uh, we're currently uh, forming what's called an NSF uh, IUCRC on insects as food and feed. And this is a partnership between IUPUI and Mississippi State University. And this is the website for the National Science Foundation program. And here's my email address if you want to learn more about it. But the way these centers work is they engage industry. So if industry, if you're paying, if you're watching this and you're interested in learning more about the industry and you want to partner, uh, it's low investment, high return. I'd be glad to share with you information about the center. It is a great opportunity to train people to work for your company. And it works across the systems. We're working with black soldier fly, mealworm, and cricket, and other insect species as well. And this is a list of the companies that have committed to being part of the center right now. And uh, we plan on having our first meeting in the fall. And if you're interested in learning more about it, send me an email. I'll be glad to tell you about it. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tamberlin, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we have time for a few questions. And the first question uh, is, are the toxic factors detected in such fats since they are fed on waste? So I'm going to speak more when we say toxic or toxin. Uh, what we know is that if you feed them a waste that has like aflatoxin, they will break it down and it's not in the insects. So they, they can actually degrade it. Heavy metals are a concern depending on what you feed them because it will accrue in their exoskeleton, but that's in their exoskeleton, which means that you could squeeze the, the insect like a grape, harvest the protein and do different things. So as a bioremediator, black soldier fly could be a good way to use it. We've used this for a variety of different things. I could tell you about work we did for Department of Defense where we were looking at bioremediation of toxic landscapes. So black soldier fly can do it, but you definitely want to test and follow core protocols on quality assurance. With bacteria or pathogens, they kill E. coli. Black soldier fly will kill out E. coli. Salmonella, they'll just they'll reduce it or remove it from the substrate, but it does, uh, it is detectable in the insect. So if you were to use it and you're worried about salmonella, you would have to do some work for um, remediating that in the insect biomass. Uh, one thing I did want to mention, a previous question to Dr. Liu was this idea of oxidation. So one thing about black soldier flies that's fascinating is somehow they stabilize these fatty acids and they don't go rancid for long periods of time. So how they do that, we don't know. But if we could figure that out, that would be a huge patent, wouldn't it be? That's good. Thank you. Um, next question is, have you looked at sterile cholesterol and phospholipid composition? So we have not, and I'm hoping that Daylon, she can talk about this and she may have some information on this more than I do. So I'm not sure, but that is a great question uh, that needs to be explored without a doubt. Sounds good. And uh, are both protein and oil approved in the US as feed ingredients? So the insect as a whole is approved. So AFCO has not gone into the specifics on that. Right now, they just say the whole insect, but AFCO is moving fast on black soldier fly. There's lots of things in the pipeline with them. And it would not surprise me if companies um, are not pushing for that because that's the whole thing is we need to figure out how to break the insect down into the parts. And if we look at economic theory, the sum of the parts is definitely greater than a whole. And I think mm -hmm. that's something that's gonna be driven soon. And I think we'll see that. Sounds good, thank you. And, uh, oh, you will be happy to hear this question. Can African startups benefit or collaborate with uh, NSF Center? Without a doubt. Uh, send me an email, I'll be glad to tell you. Uh, some of the companies that are listed, one in particular, some of you may know is Sanergy out of Kenya. 
Um, they are part of the center. Uh, they are wanting to be part of the center moving forward. So there are opportunities and the center is truly global. Uh, we wanna be a resource for everybody. Wonderful. Wonderful. With that, uh, let's pause. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tamberlin, for answering the question. Let's pause and uh, uh, and hear our Dr. Dylan Tsumpa uh, presentation, and then we will have our panel for uh, for rest of our questions. Wonderful. Uh, it's my great pleasure to present uh, Dr. Dalan Tsompa uh, for uh, our next speaker. She is a doctor assistant uh, at the Faculty of Bioscience Engineering at Kent University in Belgium. Her expertise includes food science, dairy science, lipid science, and animal production. Dalan, Dalan Tsompa has experience in academia and in agribusiness, in the food industry, and the primary production se uh, sector in companies located in Mexico, USA, and Europe. Her research focused on food structure, food chemistry, lipidomics, dairy fat, and on valorization of insect fat in oils. Thank you, uh, thank you Dr. Tsompa, for, for, for uh, accepting invitation to present today. Uh, without further, uh, for the delays, uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I want to um, uh, to uh, thank the invitation for speaking today. Uh, I'm very happy to see that this topic is starting to be in the uh, in the interest of scientists uh, because, well, I've been working in this topic almost ten years, so it's been it's exciting yeah, to see that more people are interested in it. So today I'm going to talk about insect uh, lipids in uh, use as food ingredients. And my first question is, are consumers ready for insect oils? That's something that we will discuss today. So I will start uh, giving an overview of insect oils. Uh, it has been already talked about it, so I will just go quickly over it. Then I will talk about the motivations for entomophagia in different parts and uh, different cultures. And I will end up um, discussing some applications and re the results of the consumer acceptance studies that have been done at uh, my university. So I will want to start uh, mentioning the species that are being produced in Europe. This is a statistic from 2017 from the IPIF. The IPIF is the umbrella association for the insect sector in Europe. Um, at the time they say that there were six main insect species being rare. The uh, black sword fly and yellow mealworm are the two main species. Um, also lesser mealworm and three species of crickets. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, nowadays there are uh, from these species, only two of them are, uh, have lipids as fats or oils that are commercial available in Europe. Some breaking news this week, uh, the European U Union uh, authorized the placing on the market of dry yellow mealworms. And they also specified that it should be as whole dry insect in the form of snacks or as a food ingredient. So this is very good news for the sector uh, because it opens many possibilities. Specifically, this is for uh, Tenebrio Molitor. Um, before anything, I want to show how do they look like. In the left side, you see the larvae from yellow mealworm and underneath is the um, oil from this Insect. This is a commercial oil, and it is provided. Well, it's, it is the from the brand Insects. In the right side, you see the larvae from black sword fly and the commercial fat from. Uh, this is from Protex. Um, as you see, one is an oil, one is a fat. It is very. Um, uh, uh, this is very positive because they they have both of them different possibilities. Uh, if they are applied in food ingredients. Uh, for instance, fat is very desirable to produce, uh, for instance, bakery products because it gives structure. Uh, also, I want to uh, disclaim that the 
per the oils that I use in my studies are from these two companies. Um, they kindly provided the, the oil and the fat, uh, and they did not, um, they didn't have any influence uh, when I designed my experiment. So, well, this has been shown already by many, uh, by the previous two speakers, the fatty acid composition of black salt they fly. Here, I just want to, um, to highlight that this black salt they fly larry fat can be considered a lauric fat due to its high content on lauric acid. Um, and as previously mentioned, you can also change a lot. Eh? Like uh, Christina was showing uh, uh, lauric acid content in black soda fly of 43%. Here we have 48%, which is almost the same as coconut and palm kernel oil. So uh, that means that the applications can be similar to the lauric fats that are currently, um, so the, the current applications of these lauric fats. Regarding fatty acid composition of the yellow mealworm, uh, it is high in palmitic acid, oleic acid, and linoleic acid. And something interesting here is that uh, we have found one omega-3 fatty acids, uh, which is uh, uh, omega-3 from C18-3. That's the only one that, at least uh, in our studies, we have found. Um, important to here to notice is that uh, the, this oil uh, is different in composition from two traditional edible oils, meaning sunflower oil and sesame oil, but it is very similar to that of rice bran oil. Yeah, so it has similar amount of palmitic acid, rice bran oil than yellow mealworm, as oleic acid as well. So also the saturated and unsaturated fraction is comparable. In this study, what we did is, um, well, in this graph, I want to show the similarities of the fatty acid composition of different sources of fats and oils. Um, this uh, is a principal component analysis. It's a statistical analysis that we use to check natural clustering in the data. So in this uh, study, we feed the fatty acid composition and uh, it gives us how similar or different are the samples in between them. And we can see that um, the insect oils are, have a fatty acid composition that is between that of vegetable oils and animal fats. The reason is because the insect oils are high in palmitic acid and also oleic acid is present there. Uh, moreover, some omega-3 fatty acids are there. Um, in contrast with animal fats, well, it's a bit more saturated um, and less omega-3 and poorly of unsaturated fatty acids. Um, I just added something on sterols because of this question before. So what about sterols? Huh? Um, this is a recent study from uh, 2021. Uh, the, the first reference is this one. Lipidum of cricket species used as food. Uh, not very good news, I would say, because um, the amount of cholesterol in uh, in this insect species, well, this study was only on crickets and we studied four different uh, uh, species, uh, rare under the same conditions. So uh, the difference between them are only due to genetic variability. Sorry, the, the, it's a genetic factor. So what we found is that it has a very, very high amount of cholesterol in it. If you compare it with traditional sources of cholesterol like uh, milk fat or eggs, it's at least 2.5 times uh, more which is not positive. This is, uh, is contrasting all previous data on insects uh, where they found like a very low amount of cholesterol. Several reasons, yeah, we can uh, talk about there are different species. So that's one option, one, one reason why this can be so different. But the other uh, reason can be um, how are they being rare? The, the insects from the study uh, from uh, Edpo were collected in the um, wild, while the crickets that we use are rare inside facilities with um, feed, uh, commercial feed. So that can be also one, one option. Uh, we are now currently working on how to decrease this cholesterol level. Uh, and sorry, also just want to mention, someone also asked about phospholipids. In this paper, we are also profiling the phospholipids in the crickets. And we, I'm now working on um, 
uh, yellow mealworm and black soldier fly. So in, probably by the end of the year, there will be a published, uh, paper published on that. Um, some physical properties of these oils. Well, um, these are different types of oil, yellow mealworm, lesser mealworm, cricket and cockroach. It has been presented before. Um, I just want to mention that the, the color of the oil is very dependent on how is it extracted. So here we see uh, oil from yellow mealworm. Um, this is my oil that I extracted. And this is an oil that has a, is the same species just a different extraction. And what you see is that there is a browning on it. The mechanism hasn't been studied yet, so we do not know what is causing that. It is for sure not by our reaction because the, at least the extraction that I do is always done at five degrees Celsius. So there's no um, possibility for a Maillard reaction occurring. Um, but what I think is that uh, probably is the same mechanism that is causing the browning in proteins. Um, regarding melting point, and this is uh, the last, last slide on uh, physical properties. Uh, they are, we have oils and we have fats. So the oils that we have is like yellow mealworm, lesser mealworm, crickets and cockroach. Uh, here, this is a graph of the melting profile of our fats and oils. And we see that the last melting point is very low, five degrees, two degrees, 6.6, .6, except for house cricket where the uh, last melting point is at 22 degrees Celsius. So this is this one, but it is still liquid at room temperature, meaning 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, why is this? Because we have a very big uh, fraction of low melting at below zero degrees Celsius. So this makes uh, the oil uh, liquid at room temperature. In this paper, we did not publish from black soldier fly, but I do have the, the profile of it. And this um, fat melts at around uh, 33 degrees Celsius, which is also similar to or other lauric fats. So why should we be eating all insects? And what are the motivations behind eating insects? And the question is, so why shall we all be eating insects? Um, the previous speakers already talked about that we will be too many people in this earth uh, in some years, um, that it is sustainable, it can be produced in a sustainable way, and we can also get several useful products from it, uh, uh, from insect meals, the fat, and also chitin, but also for us, which is the manure of the insects. So there are many reasons why we should be eating insects. So did I convince you? <laughs> to eat insects, to start uh, having some dishes of insects in your food. Probably some of them, uh, healthiness and sustainability will be uh, a good reason to start eating insects the first time to, for a first experience. But of course it is not enough to achieve a second purchase or to achieve regular consumption. And this is why we need to look into the motivations of the consumers uh, towards entomophagia. So other people have studied this and they show that in countries with local insect culture, the main driver for entomophagia was the taste. It is, it is delicious, that's why they are eating it. Eh? And as a person from a country where uh, entomophagia is part of the culture, I would say we eat it because it's, it's tasty, not because it's healthy or because it's environmentally friendly. And, we also eat it because it's available. It, you go to the market, you can get something. You go to the bar, you can get snacks with your beer. And it is familiar. We, we are uh, used to that, so it is a familiar food and that's what we eat it. However, in countries where insects are not recognized as food, uh, the drivers are different. Curiosity is one of them. Yeah, the, uh, healthiness is also uh, a driver and sustainability. So these uh, drive a first experience, but they are not enough to achieve regular consumption. It has also been studied that uh, reducing visibility increases consumer acceptance, as well as uh, meeting the expectations. So if we meet the expectations of the, of the consumers, then we will achieve uh, regular consumption or a second purchase. But what is meeting expectations? Huh? Um, so the, the consumer understands by meeting expectation that it has to be a familiar product. 
um, the insect-based food has to be uh, in a product with a like flavor and a like preparation. The product has also need to be appropriate. That means that they, they need to think that, okay, the, the insect in that dish is correct. Uh, and sometimes it's not the case, hasn't been the case. Uh, and the far most important driver is the taste. It needs to be good. So from these previous studies, we learn, um, and uh, we, uh, we took that knowledge uh, when we decided our research strategy. So the first thing that we included was to reduce visi uh, visibility in the insects by using oil as an ingredient. Um, we produce familiar foods and we decided to go to bakery products because um, bakery products are familiar in Western countries. We also tested for appropriateness in terms of flavor. So if the flavor from the oil is appropriate for certain dishes. And the most important thing for us is taste. We are developing, developing products that are tasty. And I will come to this back later. So now I will, I will discuss some of the, of the applications of our um, studies and the results. And the first study that we made was using black soldier fly larvae fat. And we tested, we use this uh, fat in three different bakery products that was uh, uh, pound cake, sand cookies, and waffles. Um, so in the, the, the study goes about replacing butter in these products at different levels. In the trials, we went on to 100% of substitution. However, we noticed a very strong aftertaste that was coming from the insect fat. Um, for this reason, we decided to substitute only until 50% for the final experiment with the consumers. Why? Because we do not want to give a bad first experience to the um, consumer. Uh, this will have a bad, give them a bad experience and it will hinder the consumption of insect-based foods in the future. Even if it's a different ingredient, if it's in a different situation, they will relate it to that first bad experience. That's why we went only until 50% where we decided, okay, this is a safe level where most of the consumers will not perceive it so strong. Um, the results show that we could go until 50% of butter substitution in waffles uh, without changing the consumer preference or the sensorial perception. Um, at higher levels of substitution, we, we, as I mentioned, we had of flavors. And this was the case for the waffles, but for cookies and cakes, we could only get on uh, until 25% of substitution. At higher levels, there was, uh, uh, the consumers perceive it already. Very interesting, no change in physical properties of the product, not even when we replace it 100%. That means that the black soldier fly larvae fat is giving functionality. It, there are no defects on the cake. And for instance, which defects can you have? Uh, one tip, typical uh, will be oiling off so that the oil is coming out from your product and that will be considered a, a defect. Um, that's very positive. Something uh, also good to notice is that, well, interesting from the scientific point of view is that why do we have two different behaviors between the two products? And what we think it happened is that there is a difference uh, in, on how these products are produced. Uh, cakes and cookies are produced in a convection oven while waffles was in a heating plate where the dynamics of releasing flavors and volatile compounds is different. So there will be a higher rate in the waffles as compared with the cookies because the, the temperature inside the product will be increased. So this gave us the idea for a second study. Um, in this case, we use oil from yellow mealworm and we tested, we deodorized this oil first to reduce the volatile compounds and the aroma. Some after this will be reduced. And we tested in two different matrices to test the preference, the, sorry, the appropriateness of the flavor. Yeah, so um, the results show that we can get until 100% of substitution without decreasing consumer preference. Also, the, these cookies, um, the cookies with the other ice insect oil were preferred. Uh, this was the story for the crackers, but in the humus, it was not appropriate. So that means that all the, the, the preferred product was that with vegetable oil, 100%. And 
in all the products there was an aftertaste. So they think that was not appropriate because there was a very typical flavor from the oil that was not uh, appreciated by the consumers. In the later study uh, that we're working on the publication, we use this oil uh, to fry products and fry those specifically. So we produce donuts. Um, also we use the other ice insects oil. And uh, we found out that indeed also we can use, we can get onto 100% of substitution. So 100%, the donuts fry in 100% insect oil. Um, without changing consumer percep uh, perception, and even um, the donuts with 100% uh, vegetable oil were the least preferred. Um, so something very interesting. Um, the conclusions is that the flavor profile of insect lipids affects the, the food preference, sometimes in a positive way, sometimes in a negative way. These insect lipids require a prior refining. Refining, we are we're going to use them as food ingredients. Um, the authorization is necessary, yeah? and the, pro the consumer developers should uh, consider the flavor appro appropriateness. My take home message insect oils are different from vegetable uh, oils and animal fats. Regular consumption is necessary, it can be achieved uh, if we take into account the different factors that were discussed today, and we can uh, achieve substitution of. Uh, traditional fats and oils with insect fats if these uh, oils are refined. Also very important, we need to take uh, into account if the flavor of the oil is appropriate for the product. I just uh, finally want to thank uh, my colleagues from the um, Agricultural Economics Department, which are also involved in this uh, project, and uh, Professor Kundevetti. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sompa, for, uh, for the wonderful presentation and covering even uh, some of the questions that we had in the chat. Uh, let's, uh, let's see what questions we have. So we have a few minutes for the question before we all join for the panel discussion. Can you say, uh, the question is, can you say something about uh, blanching the black soldier fly larva to prevent browning during the drying process or other processing steps. I think it's more oil processing, but I think you already received the oil, right? Yes, yes, indeed. I, I, in the beginning, I thought I worked with the extraction, but I never blanch, so I do not know. Um, I know that this uh, browning in protein is an enzymatic browning, so blanching can uh, um, stop the activity of this enzyme. So it could be positive for the oil, no browning, basically. Uh, have you determined uh, fatty acid, free fatty acids amount versus triglycerides to understand refining yield losses? So from crude, uh, so crude process, uh, crude insect fat to the, to the other rest, how much free fatty acids versus triglycerides? Yes, before um, doing the the, uh, the authorization, we did all the type of tests that are necessary. Uh, the oil that we get from uh, insect is very good, actually. Uh, it was a very low acid value almost no difference before and after. So that means that it's also very stable. And I think there are antioxidants present in the oil. Probably they will also add some antioxidants, but the, the oil that I got was no not antioxidants um, mm -hmm. and also very low in, 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 in peroxide value, in uh, acid value and the, all the parameters. Yeah. Sounds good. But that depends, of course, in, in the extraction. Huh? The, how do you extract your fat? Okay, I have difficulties. Oh, okay. 
Uh, the next question was, uh, as a process for separating oils and fats well developed, easy for industrialization? Yes, and it's already present. Huh? Uh, there are also companies that are already selling these equipment for uh, separation and they, they valorize the pellets, they get the, uh, the oil uh, and I think even the, the kiting, some of them. And, and what I know is that they are using tricanters. Okay, and just one more question. Somehow it's not moving in my... I cannot see the questions. I see one that says, apart from diet, what other strategies do you intend to use to reduce those elevated cholesterol? Um, industrially, you can eliminate cholesterol by beta cyclodextrin. Uh, that's the process that is already available for other products like egg yolk. Um, we are now doing some changes on the um, environmental settings, setups. Um, but I cannot say a lot because the, just the tests are now running. Hopefully by the end of the, of the summer, we will have um, information on that. Sounds good. So then there, is a, there was a question on, for after test. Oh, uh, let's have just one more question and then we will uh, move to the panel. So for, uh, for the aftertaste or volatile, if 100% fat used in baked product, do you know what minor components in the fats oils are responsible for this? So for off flavor. For black taste, uh, we didn't make the, the odorization. I, was, I only had the opportunity to work with that one year. Uh, we didn't make the odorization, so I do not really know. Um, I know that the lauric fats, they have themselves a very strong flavor. So if you taste the coconut oil, that's the, mm -hmm. and the people refer that after taste from the black sort of fly uh, being the taste of the lauric fat. So, uh, but that's something that needs to be studied yet. Uh, and for yellow mealworm, um, I made the deodorization and also I'm working on the paper on that. And in that paper, we did extracted the, um, during the odorization, what you do is you heat the oil under vacuum. So mm -hmm. whatever you extract is uh, condensed afterwards. And we got the condensation of that one. And that's what, what we studied also to check the compounds there. So, but um, I do not have the name of the compounds in my head now. I'm very sorry for that. <laughs> but if you give me the email, I will send the... the I can send the chart with the, the compounds present. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Somper, for presentation and uh, uh, answering the questions. Uh, I think uh, right now it's it's time for us to move for uh, Q&A panel and panel discussion when all of us are obviously very passionate about insect fat and how we can promote it and how we move it to, uh, to food and feed industry. Uh, we'll take questions from, uh, from audience. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you, Amy, for putting uh, putting us alive. Uh, right now, this is our question and answer panel. We have uh, all speakers uh, available to uh, to answer the questions. Please submit them in uh, in the system. And I have first question. So one, our first question is: Are some Anybody, anybody pursuing genetic-based options, exploring population selection, as well as gene, gene editing? Uh, anybody wants to start with a question? This is answer. 
Well, I, I think I put that comment in there. I was trying to um, respond to this idea of how uh, we're trying to address the nutritional makeup of these insects. And I mean, most of what we do is through diet manipulation, but there are efforts in place for population selection. So they're trying to develop populations that produce a certain product. So uh, just through natural selection, domestication, if you want to call it that, that's what some people are doing. Others are taking a more aggressive approach in terms of gene editing and genetic manipulation to have an insect produce a certain offspring or certain product. So that's two different pathways that are uh, being explored that I'm aware of in conjunction with diet manipulation. Yeah, maybe I can comment from the European point of view. I think in Europe, uh, they will not be pursuing any gene modification because there's uh, uh, the, the industry wants to see themselves as green, sustainable, uh, without any bad connotation, you know, uh, and GMOs are not well, um, are not welcome, let's say, by the European population. So I think that's that's not the, the way to go in Europe, uh, more in, into using other live streams of agriculture or going into, into feeding strategies or selection, huh? just as what has been happening with any other livestock. Yeah, there's a paper that we published this week in uh, BMC Biology on the population genetics of black soldier flies around the world. And if you're interested in that approach, check, check it out because it talks a lot about domestication processes and that we're seeing that in companies, that the lines they're producing are very specific. So the question uh, we have, uh, thank you. The question that we have in the chat is, can you please describe how the insect processed at manufacturing plant? Mm -hmm. So anybody wants to take this question? So I, I wanna answer uh, this question for, for general uh, information. So uh, there are uh, various of technology has have been developed to process uh, insects uh, to ingredients for uh, feed or food applications. So uh, for example, is drying, there are different uh, drying technologies has been developed for, for processing insects and also uh, for the processing technologies, different extraction technology, for example, uh, ultrasound assistant extraction and uh, uh, dry fraction, fractionation and also uh, aqueous oil extraction and uh, enzy enzyme-based extraction. Yeah, it's interesting you point out the drying methods because depending on how you dry them, it affects the nutritional makeup. So the next question for specifically for the uh, Dylan, uh, raw insect oil to table oil, what are the key steps to reach? Uh, for me it's um, refining, yeah, just as we do with sunflower oil, canola oil, with any other oils uh, that we use, uh, it needs to have a refining, probably not the entire refining process, but at least the otherization. And with that, you can achieve uh, yeah, an oil that is blunt, but not completely blunt. Also, because it can be positive. Huh? The, the especially yellow mealworm oil has some taste that can enhance uh, things. Like in donuts, we found that the donuts with the crude insect oil had a stronger flavor, a stronger donut flavor. So it, it's, uh, yeah, the deodorization probably not complete deodorization, just partial deodorization can be an option. Um, and if we want to decrease the cholesterol content, content then, um, extracting the cholesterol with the beta cyclodextrin, for instance. It's not much process, huh? and it's also not, uh, we are not inventing the wheel anymore. That's already in the industry from oils and fats from a very long time, huh? more than a century that is there. So it's just applying the knowledge that we have already in this new insect, uh, in this new source. Yep, this is, uh, 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 this is very aligned with the next uh, next comment or question that was put. That's that uh, I was uh, wondering about flavor attributes of uh, of the enlotic flavor because olive oil has very uh, very specific 
uh, flavor and depends on the sort, depends on how it was processed and where, uh, where it was made. So uh, do you have any specific, more specific descriptions for sensory profile of insect oil? And Jeff, maybe, maybe you have also uh, some sensory experiences uh, uh, around uh, black soldier fly uh, oil. Talent, well, you can start. Yes, with the, there are two types, huh, mainly that I've been working mm -hmm. with. Um, the black soldier fly, it's a very lauric fat. So it, it, I cannot explain what a lauric fat is, but just have a very small amount of coconut oil and you will see that there is a, a very specific flavor um, mm -hmm. in it. That's the lauric fat taste. And in, in black soldier fly, that's overwhelming. So I'm not sure if the odorization can modify this, but I mean, it's always worth to, to do the, the, the test if the odorization mm -hmm. helps to decrease this aftertaste. In yellow mealworm, um, when you smell the oil uh, alone, it has a very strong animal flavor. And it reminds me um, that of lard, but the lard when it's cooked, you know, not, not the commercial the one that is already fine, when it's the crude one, uh, just after deep frying pork chops in their fat. Yeah, that's the, that's the smell that I always, always comes. But when it is in a product, for instance, in the crackers, a lot of people re, uh, refer the, the taste as uh, nutty. Uh, we have also fried chips, potato chips. And the uh, people have asked me, uh, did you add shrimps? And in the other, in donuts, it just enhances in the overall flavor of the donuts. Yeah. So um, that's why we, we were also wondering, okay, which flavors are there? and also which ones can be perceived. So this, uh, I'm working on that, uh, on the, the making the profile of the uh, aroma compounds in it. It's also would be very interesting to see how it's progressed during a storage and oxidation uh, and uh, how, how flavor changes during, uh, during oxidation process. So Jeff, do you have any experience with, uh, with so, fat, sensory experience? I, you know, sure. I, a couple of things I was going to uh, say is, uh, Daylon, your, your degree, I want to ask you, your degree, what is your degree in? I, uh, my bachelor's is in animal science, uh, animal production specifically. Uh -huh. uh, then I did a master degree in food science and my PhD is in food science yes. uh, specialization in, in, um, uh, in fat. In, uh, Water, basically. Thank you. Thank you for telling me because I, I want that helps me structure my response. So what I was going to say is individuals like uh, Daylon, I mean, that's who you want to talk to because they are miracle workers with food science. I mean, you can take these things and manipulate them and create items I've never even thought possible. So I think the we're just scratching the surface on what can be done with these fats and oils. So I'm sure if anybody wants to provide a grant to her to do more research, she'd be interested. Um, so that's one thing. The second is this. Um, so black soldier flies, <clears throat> what you feed them does impact them. <clears throat> so we have to be real careful about what we feed these insects. So even in the company that I own, we, we're very particular about what we feed the insect. Now, when we dry them, um, they're not made for human consumption, but I have to admit, I have eaten some that are dried and it's like popcorn. So that's what it reminds me of. And uh, what we have found is what you feed them and how you process them is really important for that flavor. So we microwave dry, but we also starve the insect and we're really particular. We also do some fermentation process with the waste to standardize it so that the flavor profile of the insect is pretty standardized for us. What we found in terms of shelf life work with our, our insects is that somehow when we process the insect and we store it at room temperature, the fats don't oxidize as fast. I don't know what it is about black soldier fly, but they don't. And it could be just storage. I don't know. Uh, Daylon may be able to comment on that or Dr. Lou. I, so that's what I know. Um, but I will say this too. When you harvest black soldier fly larvae, starve them for 24 hours before you process them for two reasons. One, it makes it faster in terms of processing and it gets their gut content out. So you're not tasting it. <laughs> that's important. And I think if you're processing the maggot with the gut content, some of that gut content flavors coming in with your, your material. Thank you. And 
thank you, uh, Dr. Tamberlin. Uh, Dr. Lu, I think you have a very, uh, very good question. Can you feed the insect, uh, insects used frying oil? Mm. Yeah, I think definitely uh, uh, insect uh, frying oils can be part of the diet of to feed uh, insect because any organic waste can be uh, used to feed insect for uh, growing. Sounds good. And for everybody, people, uh, people are moving more on plant-based and vegan food now. In your view, how we can market and position insect fat, protein, and food? Any extra benefit over plant-based food? <laughs> I, I just want to say, um, I don't think that the insect market integrates with the vegan market at all, um, being that they're animals. Uh, in terms of benefit, and we had this conversation, uh, the panel before uh, our presentations. The big push for black soldier flies is because it's so environmental. And I think that's a big kick. I think that's a big positive. Also a question about the frass that's produced from these insects. They can be used as fertilizer. So it can replace like traditional fertilizers. There's another benefit there. Um, and the last thing I just wanna say is this. I do think cricket and mealworm can, diets need to be formulated for them that's more sustainable. And I think that can be done. So I think we can diversify the insects as food and feed market, and we can make all the models more environmentally friendly and more sellable. And I think that's a big thing because people vote, they pay their conscience. You know, if they know they're eating something that's going to protect the environment, I think that goes a long way to enhancing the industry. That's just my two cents. Yep, I definitely agree. I think what it's also be, uh, be, uh, beyond sustainability, what insect, uh, uh, insect, insects are offering is a huge opportunity for flexibility, design, design for application, design for optimum use of resources, and have specific fat for design, uh, design and use. This have protein that needed, if it's designed for protein, for, for application and in the most optimal way is the least uh, used resources. Can I make one more comment? Yes. And that is, you know, there is work taking place now. Daylon probably can comment on this too. And uh, Dr. Leo, you may know something about it too, is that is there is work being done now showing how the microbiome of a human yep. responds to this. And there's indications that it's actually quite positive. Because if you think about it, Humans have prob as pointed out, humans have eaten insects for a long time. There's a selection process there. Um, so the, even the gut response of humans and other vertebrates to insect-based protein and the fats and oils has been very positive. And we're just starting to scratch the surface. Uh, I would uh, like to add a comment uh, regarding this. Uh, how can we use insects in this new protein transition? Um, I would think like for vegans, it's not possible for, but for vegetarians it can, because there are two types of vegetarians. Uh, one type of vegetarian is because of the um, problems, yeah, health problems that they cannot uh, eat certain animal based ingredients, it's okay. But there are others that uh, <laughs> the main driver is a sustainability. So those type of consumers we can reach because uh, the insects are sustainable and they are also, um, the, they, they take a look at um, animal welfare. So that's also something that we don't have an issue with insects. Uh, those type of, of vegetarians we could reach with insects also. And we see, I have seen that in my studies. Huh? Um, we have many vegetarians taking part in our consumer studies. But however, I do not have the data. I do not have exactly. Mm -hmm. We have never included them, but it could be interesting to know, say, okay, are you vegetarian? And then just ask, like, why are you taking part of this? <laughs> mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah, definitely another comment. And, and with the trend is uh, moving from uh, for the uh, plant-based or vegan-based uh, products, but definitely insect-based uh, protein or fat can ex expand the profile to the whole food system not just like plant-based system. Yep, so beyond limitations of the uh, plant, uh, plant sources. Wonderful. Uh, next one we have, 
Uh, can BSF oil be refined to kerosene and serve as a biofuel for the aviation industry? How does the melting temperature affect the process? Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I know that uh, Hermetia, that's a um, company in Germany, they already produce that, but as a, um, it's not a commercial, just as a prototype, and they produce kerosene with it. Yeah, there's a lot of papers coming out now on this. Uh, we I published a few on it with people from Hawaii and from China, and it's the process is much straight. It's pretty straightforward, and uh, there's lots of potential there. And uh, last one we have uh, last question in the chat. I see, is the potential for using insect fats for replacement for industrial lubricants currently fossil fuel based? So, and the answer is also, I think, yes, it was covered uh, by Dr. Lu in the first, in the first uh, presentation. Yes, there is, uh, there is a work is in progress. Okay. Let me see if I miss anything because I had some technical, uh, Are cold extraction methods recommended in order to reduce nutrients degradation already industrial equipment to cold extraction method? Do we have any, any, any comments on the cold extractions? Well, um, in, at the beginning I was using, I was studying uh, extraction, cold extraction, and we did that to avoid um, degradation of amino acids and fats. Um, but it was just as, as in the lab scale, not the industrial scale. In industrial scale, I'm not aware. And I think probably it's not even possible because they need to blanch the insect. So that is, yeah, it's already higher than probably 70, 80 degrees Celsius. So it's, I don't think it's possible. But uh, yeah, I think the, 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 the degradation of the nutrients will be limited. Eh? But, but that's what only what I, uh, expect. I have never studied that part. Sounds good. And overall, as, uh, as this area will be developed, uh, I'm sure that uh, processing part of it will, will advance even, even more and further uh, to, 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 target, to, to deliver target products and product specifications as a, as a, final, uh, as a final product of refining. Uh, I ha we have one more question. In addition to the fat content of the substrate, will the fiber content have a significant influence on the performance of the black soldier flies larvae? For instance, will, be, will there be significant difference in performance when, when the substrate has more plant matter than animal matter? Is it matter, plant versus animal, and what's the, uh, what's the ratio? I think Jeff, you already uh, covered it partially in your presentation. So, yes. Yeah, so, uh, and this goes back to a question I was asked earlier about what's being fed to the insect. So, on blacks, I mean, crickets and mealworms are pretty specific what you feed them, and they got the mm -hmm. standardized diet. Black soldier flies, it's like, let's throw it at them and see if they eat it. And they eat just about anything. Um, but preparation is going to be important. So if you're going with something with a high fiber content, such as say rice straw, uh, you're going to have to do a fermentation process to loosen up that fiber and make it more accessible to the nutrients, more accessible to the insects. So cellulose is potentially degraded by black soldier flies, but the processing of the material before feeding it to the insect will be critical. Uh, so it can be done. And FYI, we did find things they won't eat. Um, I can tell you about that some other time. Uh, just to add a comment, in Europe, it's not possible to do that. Uh, you cannot feed insects with uh, animal sources for safety reasons. So animal sources, you're talking about like uh, offal, or, or are you talking like manure, or both? Both. Yeah. Manure like super prohibited and uh, also uh, meat. So that's one of the reasons why the catering waste is not accepted. Uh, it's not approved as a feed for yeah. insects here in Europe. So they are quite strict in that sense. So I'd, I'd love to make a comment here. And this is Jeff Tomberlin as a professor to everyone that's listening. 
Yes, there are EU standards that need to be followed for the EU. And yes, there are standards for the US and other areas, but this does not mean that dictates what you do in your country. Um, yeah. These processes can be validated and they can be found to be safe and effective. It's just what some cultures have chosen not to use. So do not shy away as long as you do it safely and effectively and you determine that it's, it is something that can be done without harming someone. Don't let what we do in our countries dictate what you do. Be, be challenging and think outside the box because animal manure, uh, food waste, these are all viable resources. If you prep them the right way and take the right precautions, you can produce very sustainable protein for livestock. Sorry and also the, 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 your final application, it's related to, to the feed that you can use. Huh? Of course, food is very, uh, has to be produced in a very safe way. Uh, but yeah, if you are using the, the oil for, to produce fuels, for instance, then you don't have those problems. Huh? Sure. Uh, I just, other applications, huh? surfactants or something else. Yeah. I, I mean, this is the rule for surfactants, let's say. Sure. But for me, you know, I look at the North America, I look at the U.S. and I look at the EU and it's just a small part of the world. And there are, you know, when I think about animal manure or I think about fish offal and other substrates, they can be used effectively. It's just our countries choose not to do it. They choose for various reasons not to follow that. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with it. I just don't want to restrict anyone else in the world from exploring opportunities to do it because I think it can be done safely. Indeed. Sounds good. Uh, I think we covered all the questions that we have, uh, uh, we have in the chat. So thank you uh, everybody for participation. Thank you audience for uh, listening our, our Hot Topic Symposium. We believe it's important. We believe that this is what's coming and this is what uh, of what relevant to our industry for, for today and tomorrow. Uh, if you have any additional questions or questions that haven't been covered, uh, you are absolutely welcome to send, send your questions to speakers or to me, and I will forward them. Again, thank you for your participation. I just want to thank you for organizing this, and I want to thank the, thank the presenters for the candid discussion. It's really great. I miss this. And thank the audience for the wonderful questions. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thanks for everyone to join this virtual meeting.